three, two, one. You ain't seen nothing yet. Everybody, welcome back to another week of our podcast. I'm Chef Rich Rosendell. I'm joined by our co-host Christopher Ryloff and Rachel Barnett. And this week we had the opportunity to sit down and talk with iconic chef and restaurateur Thomas Keller. Now, many of you know Chef Keller as the owner and proprietor of the Thomas Keller Restaurant Group, uh, acclaimed cookbooks. Uh, I mean, he's he's done so much. He really has been pivotal in American cuisine. Uh, multi Michelin star restaurant chef. Uh, but I know him from a different perspective. Obviously, in my time with him in Boku store, uh, really kind of took on more of a, he became more of a mentor uh, to me. And that's one of the reasons I'm kind of wearing this uh, scarf here today, uh, because one of the coolest memories from going through the Boku store uh, was finally seeing all of the hard work from the entire team, especially uh, a lot of it driven uh, as one of the leaders uh, in the organization, Chef Keller. And whenever he, we, we finally all uh, were able to see victory in the United States place on the podium, uh, seeing the joy in his face, uh, in that scarf, uh, as he wore it so proudly carrying the, the country's colors, uh, was just a, it was an amazing thing. And it felt so good to be able to be part of that. So uh, as part of uh, the holiday, season i have an extra one of these i'm gonna send one of these out to somebody that subscribes uh to our channel um so thank you uh, to chef keller for continuing to be an inspiration for so many and also for helping us uh see the reality of the united states finally being world champions in the boku store something that many thought was unheard of for years so we're going to get started with the interview here shortly but before we do I want to give a big shout out to our title sponsor uh vitamix they have been incredible supporting us with all of our episodes and uh i'm this time of year i'm doing a lot of baking i try to do as much as i can with my kids uh, one of the things I wanted to point out with the Vita Prep 3, uh, I use that one at home. I use it in uh, our professional kitchens. But one of the things I really love is how simple uh, a lot of the recipes are. Uh, and there's and there's things that you can do in this blender that you can't do in other blenders. One of them is a lemon curd. Uh, you got to try this. In fact, we'll, we'll post it online so everybody can check it out. But literally, you put all of the ingredients, your eggs and sugar, um, you put your uh, lemon juice, the, the eggs, everything goes into the blender. You blend it for like five minutes and you slowly add the butter. Uh, and it literally, the RPMs, this machine is so powerful that it literally will make the curd for you. There's no other additional steps. You basically pour it out, you let it set and you can use it. I, I use it as a filling for cookies. Uh, it's a great recipe. But again, just kind of pointing out uh, my affinity for great equipment and Vitamix has been a huge pillar of supporting us uh, through the years. And thanks again for supporting us with the podcast. All right, well, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started and dig in with Chef Thomas Keller. Uh, Chef Thomas Keller, uh, really iconic um, chef. You I mean, you've had such a big impact on uh, people like myself and just all of the people around you, everything from restaurants to cookbooks, uh, media, I mean, all sorts of things. I mean, I, I know Early on in my career, I remember getting uh, the French Laundry Cookbook, and uh, one of the big highlights of my career was actually being able to meet you. and And, and, and you know, you've had such a big impact on on me and so many other uh, so many other people that haven't met you just because of your reputation. And uh, the big reason we wanted to reach out to you, uh, obviously, 2020 has just been such a crazy year, and I feel like a while well, really, I mean, so many people look to you as uh, really to kind of indicate or help us kind of navigate through what has been a remarkably turbulent year for so many people. And um, obviously, you, know, you always have words of wisdom, and I, I appreciate you. I text you. I know you get a lot of calls, a lot of texts these days uh, with so much activity happening. I, I appreciate you taking the time to be on the show. So uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. It's, a, you know, it's always a pleasure. And um, you, you – it's – one thing I love about our professions um, is that we're here to support one another. And so it's, it's a profession that's always giving. And I think that is at the core of who we are. And as you know, when you first walked in the kitchen at, 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 at that young age and the chef told you to do something, you didn't debate with him. You didn't say no. I mean, you lost the word no. Uh, the, sooner, the day you walked into a kitchen, it was always yes, chef. 
Um, and I, I think that's part of what makes us unique um, as a profession is that we always want to uh, give people what they want, uh, what they need. Um, we always want to make them happy. Uh, we want to nourish them. We want to nurture them. We want to train them. We want to mentor them. Um, this is just this is just our innate um, uh, our, our, our innate um, feelings. This is where we get emotionally connected uh, to our profession. is is just that is this idea that we are we are, we are giving. Um, and others are receiving, and through that re receiving, they are nurturing themselves in one way or another. Well, Chef, you know, this year, do, you know, providing that that nurturing and, and trying to keep up that momentum, um, as you know, I mean, 2020 has been just like this uh, this whirlwind. It's like, you know, you would think that um, w as if a pandemic wasn't enough uh, for one year, it's almost like we're living in this this movie. Uh, really, one of the things I want to kind of ask you about is like, you know, how have, how have your restaurants responded to not just the pandemic, but also the all the the social unrest in the country, uh, the uh, the wildfires, which, by the way, I hope everybody out there is staying safe. But I mean, how how have you been like navigating and like recalibrating through that? Well, it's a good question, and and and, and since there's no um no clear path, you're, you're trying to find your way, you're trying to do what you feel is the best um, for, for yourself, uh, certainly for your team, for your community, uh, and that community goes beyond just here in Yonko, I'm talking about our community as, as professionals, uh, and it goes beyond our country. Um, you know, we reach out to our community in other, in other countries, whether it's Asia, uh, certainly Australia, Europe, um, you know, just being able to be there um, for others uh, at this time. So, you know, it began, you know, on March 18th for us, which is a very sad night. It was a Friday night here in Yonville, and we closed all of our restaurants. We had approximately 1,200 employees um, on March 18th, and on, on March 20th, um, or sorry, March 21st, uh, we, we, we furloughed approximately uh, 1,180 or 1,176 employees, oh, you know, uh, from, from, from South Florida, uh, through, through New York, uh, Las Vegas, uh, wow. and then again here in Yonko. And, and that, you know, that's something that you really is very difficult to prepare yourself for. Um, even though I didn't know every single one of those uh, individuals, uh, I had a connection to them because I understand what it's like to be able to go to work every day, uh, to be able to, 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 to apply your craft, um, to be able to serve your guests, um, to be able to to, to organize your, 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 your wine program. I mean, all the different things that restaurants were able to touch. Um, and it, it just all stopped. And so, so we had to pivot in many different ways. And, you know, we did a lot of things, uh, which, which I think was part of what everybody was doing, um, trying to support their staff, number one. So we, we kicked off uh, our Keller Restaurant Relief Fund. Um, we did a, a, it's a, a 501c3, um, so tax deductible. And, you know, through Mentor, you know, we did that, we offered that opportunity for a lot of, uh, a lot of our colleagues because um, uh, our, our council there was, was working with us to make sure that we, we did it correctly and our 501c3s came through quickly. Um, and, and, you know, the, the IRS was, was, was facilitating that because they understood the enormity of what a lot of people were facing that and to be able to raise money uh, for the staff was, was critical. So that was one thing we did. Um, and, you know, I'm really, it's remarkable, and I, I'm not really involved with it because I can't be an influencer. I have five of our, of our staff members from across the country, one of our partners, uh, and, of course, our human resource director who, um, who, who have been administering that. And I'm really happy to say that we've raised almost three-quarters of a million dollars and, uh, and, wow. and given out in grants uh, over, over half a million dollars. And, you know, that's for whatever they need. Um, you know, it could be groceries, it could be rent, it could be, you know, their utility bills, whatever. And whether it's in, whether it's in South Florida, New York, uh, Las Vegas, or, or even here in Yonville. Um, and, and so that's been really good. And, and I have to say, um, our guests and, and strangers, um, you know, just people who've been contributing to that from, you know, from, from the woman up the street that gives a $30 check every month, you know, who, <laughs> who writes a much larger check. I mean, they're all so meaningful. Um, and, and they all really want to help. Uh, so that was one thing we did immediately. 
um, we pivoted to make sure that we were being able to offer our immediate community um, a, a source of, of nutrition and nourishment. So we started making um, meals um, at a very inexpensive um, cost for, for the community. And I think we charged $19 for a three course meal. Um, wow. and anybody can come by and, and pick one up. And at the height of that, we were doing four or 500 meals a day. Um, and you know, the donations, again, the support that we received from, from our suppliers, you know, whether it was, whether it was Diamond Ranch or, or, or Cisco, you, you know, the names, all these, right. uh, so, right. uh, Snake River Farms. I mean, they were, they were so generous with their contributions that helped us maintain a very low cost. Um, and we had, you know, just, just the staff that was here in Yonville, uh, the chef de cuisines, the general managers, the sommeliers of the restaurants, uh, who all took a considerable cut in their salaries just to be able to continue working and supporting our efforts uh, for, for, for our community. Um, we fed our, our, our staff, our immediate staff, twice a week. They would come by and just pick up a dinner. We started a, a small food bank here in Yonville where people can come pick up uh, bags of groceries once a week. Uh, so whatever we could do, we did, you know, and then of course expanding that out to uh, work with our, the international, or sorry, the independent restaurant coalition, as you know, or the national restaurant association. Right. Um, we started big, which was the business interruption group um, to try to get the insurance companies to, uh, to, to be a little more responsible to, to, to their policy holders. So it, it became a, this massive undertaking of things that we've never done before while our restaurants are closed for, you know, close to four months. Um, but we never tired of it. Uh, and we, we always came to work in the same way we came to work pre-COVID, which was a, which with, with a sense of excitement, you know, commitment. Uh, wanting to do a better job than we did yesterday, and, and that really prevailed. Um, our bakery here in Yonto never closed um, through, through past crisis and disasters uh, we've experienced here in Northern California or across the country. We've always kept our bakery open because we want somewhere in our community for people to go to, you know, in the morning and get a cup of coffee and croissants. Um, so that was kind of the, 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 the center of our town. Um, for for that for that three and a half months, and, and we're really proud to be able to do that. And again, you know, this is you know Michael Manila, who's our general manager at, at the French Audit. You know, he's the barista, two two days, two mornings a week. Um, you know, I, I'm down there packaging goods. So it was, <laughs> it was it was it was a moment where the the level of commitment, uh, compassion, empathy for what we were all experiencing. Um, was embraced with with vigor and, uh, and 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 dedication. I was really proud of that. So that's kind of what we did here uh, in in our community. I mean, I think that you doing that too. There's actually something kind of almost like therapeutic for uh, the employees and the team that during that crazy time that you know you feel like there's this sense of good. You know, the the culture that you create. I mean. I feel like that's that kind of almost has its own kind of healing properties for for people as you're kind of going through something like this. Yeah, absolutely, and not only us. I mean, you know, we started a, a small initiative uh, called um, you know, Big Hearts and Small Farms, where where I would get four chefs plus myself around the country, and um, for example, Keith Martin, our lammer in, in, in Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. I mean, the, the farmers, all of our suppliers, all of our farmers, fishermen, foragers, gardeners, grocers. I mean, they all kind of just stopped. And, and Keith was really struggling. So our first initiative was, you know, the five chefs taking a specific cut from, from Keith, um, having vegetables from, from our friend Lee Jones, as you know, and, and then mm -hmm. and having Diane St. Clair, who supplies our butter, uh, put some into a kit, and we each prepared the dinner. Uh, and every week it was launched so to, to help them um, through, through, through awareness and bringing awareness to what they do. Uh, one with Gavin and, and one of his um, farmers in, uh, in Minnesota. Uh, wow. So we, we, we kept at that a little bit. And, and so just trying to support everybody we can. But, you know, it, it consumes your time. It's things that we're not used to doing. Um, but um, we rolled up our sleeves and, and did it. I did a lot of Instagram stories uh, on, on just simple food at home. Just trying to Which I love, by the way. Those have, <laughs> those have been <laughs> yeah. awesome. Yeah, just like, trying you to should do that all the time. time. Trying to keep people engaged. You know, they're all home. They have to eat, mm -hmm. so... You know, yeah, some simple food and giving them some technique and some um, uh, and some skills to to continue with with feeding their families or feeding themselves at home. Yeah, Chef, uh, I think that what, what you said it's uh, it's really important for everyone to know that um, all the sacrifices that you have behind because you haven't stopped, and as you and many other restaurant owners and and leaders in the in the industry, 
um, they haven't really stopped and, and people are just, there's some people just complaining because restaurants are closing and everything, but they don't see the, the really problem behind and they don't see the sacrifices that all of you are doing. I think that that's really important. And, and, and just talking about that, you, you were telling us about everything that you're doing today. Uh, how was a, a, a live a day uh, in Chef Thomas Keller pre-pandemic? How, how was that before all this crisis? Yeah, well, pre, I mean, pre-pandemic, you know, it's, it's up at, you know, not, not super early, but between 7 and 8 in the morning, have my breakfast, get my day ready. Um, I'll go to the restaurant because I live here in Yonko, so walking over to the restaurant, uh, the French Laundry every morning and just checking in there. And then, and then it was always into some, some meetings. Um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, as we've grown our businesses, uh, we've been consumed with things that weren't part of our, um, um, our reason for becoming chefs. We all became chefs. We really wanted to cook. Um, but now that we've grown our businesses, um, we, we, are, we are trapped, or I shouldn't say trapped. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Maybe, that was, slip, maybe that was a slip up. I don't know. <laughs> but we're responsible for, for many of the things. But you know, every day, um, I, I can't wait for that five o'clock time or that five thirty to to get back into the kitchen. You know, to, to get my whites on and 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 be in the kitchen uh, with the staff and and of course with the guests. I mean that that just brings me such um, such happiness. And still today, you know, after forty three years. Um, in the kitchen, it still brings me great happiness. Um, that's great. Uh, so, you know, it, it, that's that's kind of what I live for every day. Yeah, that's that that's really. I, I think that that's great, and that I'm pretty sure that that feeling of fulfillment that that you get when you put your whites on and you get back to talk to the guests or go back to the kitchen, talk to the cooks and the chef, it has to be incredible. You know, yeah. that's uh, that's amazing. They even let me cook once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that they get pretty nervous when you are around. It's like when you're in the in, <laughs> oh, in yeah. the university or something, and you yeah. have your instructor right on top of you. It's like, am I doing it right or not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, we've all been there. So you know, yeah, the same way. For, it was the same way for me when I was a young chef. Right? I knew <laughs> I'm sure the same way. Right. Yeah. As Chef uh, Rich mentioned earlier, you really are a leader in the hospitality industry. Um, but what can the everyday Americans be doing to be helping out the restaurant industry and helping? I mean, we as chefs, we're, we're doing as much as we can. You just listed everything you're doing. But what can the everyday people be doing to help our industry? It's a really good question. And, and the first thing you know, I like to say is making sure that you're supporting the restaurants in any way you can that, that, are, that are open offering takeout, offering delivery, offering some form of dining, whether it's, you know, indoors, depending on the state or outdoors, depending on the state. Um, and then again, there's a lot of restaurants that have, uh, have set up also relief funds um, for, for their staff. And so, you know, donating to that really goes to a, 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 a great cause and that's supporting those who, who are individually um, challenged financially um, with, the, with the current condition. So those are things you can do, but also, you know, support your support the farmers. Um, you know, it's really important, and there's a lot of farmers out there, and you can find them on on, on the internet. You can you can learn about them. They're in your community as well. If you're you know here like here in Northern California, we have a lot of farms around us um, that we know about and that we can support. Um, there aren't farmers markets that much anymore. Uh, if there are, you know, then then it's all it's a very difficult and controlled environment. Um, but anyway, any way you can support those farmers, those fishermen, those foragers, those gardeners. Because we need them as restaurateurs, as chefs. We're going to need them. Right? We're going to need them once we come out of this. And if they're not, then, then we're going to have the ingredients that we need to be able to, 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 to prepare and give to, to our guests. You know, I, I also want to talk about, you know, the wineries. I mean, we're here in Napa, California. And, uh, you know, our wineries, um, you know, have, been, have also been hit, whether it's Napa or Sonoma, you know, throughout the world. Um, yes, there has been, there has been some um, backfill from, Retail, you know, people are drinking at home, uh, but still, I mean, their sales are way, way down. So, which means that they're laying off people. Um, so we need we need to be able to support you know, this entire what we call this entire community uh, mm -hmm. that we have in order for us to 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 come out of this in, in a holistic way where we're 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 all intact again because we can't lose any segment. We can't lose our staff. I mean, New York City has been devastated, and most of our staff at per se. 
um, went home, right? They're, most of them are, 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 are young individuals. Um, and they went home to, their, to wherever they came from um, because they, they couldn't afford to live in New York City without a job. So they went back to, to, to live with their parents or, 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 or with their friends somewhere else. So, you know, getting them back is going is, is to be a real challenge. So opening up New York, which is scheduled in another month, is going to be a challenge just to try to find the people that we need um, to come back to work. So, you know, they're, they're, we're, we're faced with so many obstacles um, moving forward um, that uh, – it's almost overwhelming. So what we like to do is just take it one day at a time um, and just, you know, wake up and put one foot in front of the other uh, and keep moving forward because if we stop, then we're never going to get anywhere. And it's just, it's just accepting the challenges. Um, but, you know, our, our, our profession, our industry uh, is, is really crippled. And not only, not only do we need the support of, of, of our communities and those within our communities, um, we also need the support of our, of our federal government and our state government um, um, and, our, and, our, and our county government and, our, and our, our municipality governments. I mean, our mayor, you know, he has a lot of say here in what happens here in Yapo, of course. Um, our governor has a lot to say what goes on in California. Um, and of course, you know, our, our, our Senate and our House representatives, they have most of the say what goes on in our, in our federal government and how that's going to work. Uh, we spend a lot of time working with the with the White House and 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 and, and Congress on on the PPP, um, we spent months on that. And we we finally we finally got a, a, a meeting with with the White House, um, with Secretary Mnuchin, with uh, uh, Secretary Scalia, who's the Vapor Secretary, and of course President Trump and Vice President uh, uh, Pence. Um, and and I, I, I'm sure that we convinced them that day. There was nine of us in that room from different segments of our profession. Uh, some of them corporate. Um, some of them chains, uh, some of them independents, um, but we all prevailed that uh, the PPP needed to change. And uh, I, they heard us that day. And uh, within short order, we had a different PPP model than we had previously that, which was more appropriate for restaurants. So, you know, moving forward, I think, you know, hopefully that, that, that our leaders in, uh, in Congress will understand that if there is a new PPP, that they'll be able to modify it in a way that it deals with each profession in its own way, because each profession is different. And this one size fits all didn't really work. And so, you know, we, 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 we challenged them with that and they, and they came through. So it's just a matter of being persever you know, perseverance. Perseverance is, is, is so important. We all know that as people in our profession, because um, that, that is one of the most things, one of the most important things that we have to be as young, young professionals. And then young business owners um, is just never give up, uh, and we can do we can do the things. The RRC is doing a great job now. Uh, hopefully, with the Restaurants Act of 2020, uh, the NRA is also supporting the Restaurants Act 2020. So we'll see what happens there. We have almost 200 um, uh, House of Representatives signed on and co-sponsoring our bill uh, in the House. Um, in the Senate, we're not doing as well, but uh, we're hopefully we'll make some ground there. But either way, uh, point being is our is our governments need to be able to um, lead us through this process and give us the, the, the right information, the correct information, um, uh, be leaders that we've asked them to be. Uh, we're struggling with, the rec you know, sometimes they're just recommendations. They're not necessarily um, uh, directives. They're, and, and so we're left with trying to, trying to figure out what to do sometimes. And, um, and it's sometimes that makes it difficult. Well, certainly, I mean, hearing that perspective uh, from somebody like you uh, and then, you know, coupled with all of these other uh, industry uh, people, it's very compelling because, you know, you can actually see the, the continuity that every, it's not just like one restaurant or one industry. I mean, this has been really a uh, very epic impact on uh, at, at every level, every aspect of uh, how people eat and, you um, you know, we definitely appreciate all of uh, all of the the championing for for that cause for because it's really all of all these things that you're doing. It really does help uh, just, you know, the, the pizza place um, in town or the, you know, the small mom and pop restu restaurant right up to, um, you know, multi outlet venues. I mean, uh, it's so important. It's the small ones that I'm worried about the most because they yes. don't really have, you know, the ability uh, on their own. And, you know, there's over. Uh, 400,000 restaurants in America with revenue of less than $1.5 million a year. I mean, think about that, right? Almost half of our restaurants in America produce less than $1.5 million in revenue. 
Right. Um, yeah. And so we need to make sure that we're thinking about them. I know, you know, the, being part of the uh, Independent Restaurant Coalition, we're always talking about small business. Being part of the NRA, we're talking about everybody. Um, unification is really important for us to be unified. Uh, yes. You know, the IRC says there's 11 million people in our profession in the independent side. The NRA says there's over 16 million people in our profession, you know, in, 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 if you count everybody. And then, and then if you start to count, you know, all of our, all of our suppliers, all those, the, 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 uh, that supply chain, you're well over 20 million people oh, are, yeah. are, you know, impacted by this. And to be unified together, um, we we'll have a really strong voice. So, yeah, the, the smallest restaurants we need to be taken care of first and foremost. And, and, and the larger restaurants that have the ability to survive would, would be the last ones in line. But we all have to come together uh, to be unified, to have a common voice. And that common voice is that we need to get our restaurants um, reopened. We need to restart our economy. We need to bring back our staff. And we need to do that in a way that's going to be, that, that, that's going to be safe. For everybody and following all the the cdc protocols those are really really important um we're, we're starting to face winter you know as you know in the next couple months we're going to see a drastic change here in, in northern california right you know in california it gets cold uh and then rainy um new york's going to get snow um so you know all across uh, our country we're going to see a drastic change in weather and so now what we have is outdoor dining that's that's going to come to an abrupt end unless we figure out a way to allow indoor dining um, in, 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 a, in a way that affords us the opportunity to, to create the revenue that we need to support the, the restaurants and the staff. And one of the other uh, side things of that is uh, what my wife and I have not bargained for is uh, distance learning with <laughs> three kids. Like that was one thing that I didn't bargain for, but you know, it's been a, uh, it's been an interesting year. Um, so chef, Another thing that if you really think about, I mean, obviously this stuff is, has a lot to do with restaurants, but we've, we've over the years been affiliated with, um, I guess I would consider this almost for me, it was like a kind of extracurricular. It's like, I'm doing my job as a chef, but I always wanted to be part of something. Uh, culinary competition is one of the things I gravitated toward. And uh, I know the, the Mentor Foundation and Boku's Door, it has had a profound uh, impact on my life and my career. Uh, the friendships that were were that were were created, uh, but also this sense of uh, really kind of understanding the uh, the whole team aspect uh, and being part of uh, an initiative, and uh, uh, th that that whole organization. I mean, as much as it's how wonderful it's been for me to be part of it, and, and so many other chefs across America. Um, how how has twenty twenty kind of changed maybe the priorities or? just the whole, the organization in general, just with Mentor uh, and Boku store in, in the United States. Yeah, well, you know, as, as you know, like everybody else, we're, we're struggling. We're just trying to keep our head above water, you know, at the foundation. Um, so, you know, we, we worked on our fundraising and, and, and trying to work, working on our expenses, like everybody, uh, just trying to extend, you know, that, that road ahead so that we have enough resources to support us through, through the pandemic and through 2021 is where we are right now. Um, or where we feel we need to be, um, you know. As, as far as, as as the foundation, we we are we are raising money through the foundation for, um, you know, for our, our, um, our culinary council. Um, so you know, the culinary council members have been afforded some some financial support through Mentor. I'm really proud of that. Raising money through through Mentor for them uh, has been great. Uh, you know, we had our we had our uh, national competition uh, at the end of 2019. Um, and with the with our eyes on starting training in, in February uh, here in Napa, uh, we built our uh, training kitchen. Uh, we're using it for the second time at the at the Culinary Institute of America um, Copia um, um, uh, um, property, and we're really proud uh, to have uh, um, uh, Jeffrey and William, both from Hawaii, um, represent the U.S. Um, going forward in 2021. Uh, and again, we, you know, we all know that, that COVID happened and, and we had to kind of realign our priorities. We didn't feel, and, and this was the first year I, I stepped down as president of the team and our great friend, you know, Gavin Kaysen, um, yeah. he stepped up and became the president of the U.S. team. I'm still the president of, of, of the foundation, but, you know, it's time for me to, to step off that, 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 one, that one podium and allow him to do it, that the next generation. Um, 
But we had a hard time uh, really justifying uh, trying to raise money um, for a culinary competition in 2021 at this time in, in, in our country. Um, we felt it was a little bit irresponsible. Um, we needed to raise money just to support our, ourselves, our staffs, our communities, um, and, and to try to raise money for a culinary competition, um, we, didn't feel, um, we didn't feel it was the right thing to do. So we, we bowed out of the 21 competition. Um, I think that certainly the international committee was a, little, was a little bit disappointed in that. But we explained very well that we just didn't feel good about going out and trying to raise, um, you know, and you know how much it cost to, to right. send the team to, 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 to France. Um, and then we needed to focus on our own businesses and make sure that we survived this. Um, right. And make sure that we had this opportunity. Um, so that's, that's where we are. Um, we're not going to compete in 2021. Uh, my recommendation uh, to the international committee was to just postpone it a year, right. take a year off, and then resume in twenty in in, in twenty two. Um, you know, and that way everybody everybody around the world would have a chance to take a breather in in this in this moment in time because we're all facing COVID. Um, I think they felt it was important to try to bring the international community together, the international culinary community together uh, in Lyon in in twenty one in January of twenty one. Um, just out of respect for, 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 for elevating the, the awareness of what the community of chefs were doing and bringing right. them to have this wonderful competition. And, 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 and certainly that, that is, that is a, a one strategy. I think it's a good strategy. It's just not something that we in the United States uh, could, could embrace and, and try to raise money for. Well, yeah, I mean, especially just given the, uh, when you think about all of the preparation leading up to that, I mean, and where the focus is. So I, mean, I think that that was, uh, I mean, I think that makes so much sense. And um, I, I, th I know a lot of our listeners will, pre will appreciate even kind of knowing uh, so that when things do get back to normal, that they can get behind uh, the organization again and, and support all of the uh, future candidates. So, yeah. Hey guys, we're going to take a quick break. I just wanted to say thank you all for watching. And also, if you want to see any of our past episodes, you can go to YouTube at Rosendell Collective. We have all of the past episodes on there, the video version. And also, you can listen to us everywhere that you find your favorite podcast. Always please like and subscribe. We appreciate that. Thank you all for supporting the show. And also, thank you to Vitamix. They're our title sponsor for today's episode. Uh, listen, one of the blenders that I'm using a lot this time of year is the XL. We use that in our restaurants because we're making lots of incredible, silky smooth pureed soups. And we don't sacrifice any of the power for having that larger upgraded capacity with the XL. Anyway, check out their entire line of blenders on their website. And now let's get back to the conversation with Chef Thomas Keller. Chef, what about the unsung heroes? Uh, I mean, one thing I was, I think people, I, I've at least in my time with you over the years, I've really noticed, you know, you've always been uh, the first to kind of point out, you know, members uh, on your team. Uh, you know, I've always appreciated, you've always um, have recognized uh, when we've done dinners and events and stuff like that. And, and I know that during this time in 2020, there's been a lot of like unsung uh, heroes, maybe in the community or on your team. Um, are there, are there any that kind of come to mind with that, that 2020 has really, that you've really noticed? Well, you know, again, my entire management team, you know, both kitchen and dining room, um, you know, coming together for that three and a half months, um, taking a, a, a really a deep, a deep salary cut, uh, still coming to work every day with a, with a sense of enthusiasm, uh, commitment and dedication and purpose, uh, to support you know, to support our community here in, in, in Yonville and Napa Valley, um, that, that was really inspiring, you know, to see, <laughs> to see, our, you know, J Janie down at, uh, at Bouchon Bakery every morning at six o'clock getting ready by herself, you know, yeah. <laughs> with only two bakers in the back, you know, one baking bread and one doing the, the, the morning, the morning Danish and the morning croissants and just the three of them, you know, and she would be there every morning to greet, to greet the customers, the guests that were coming in to get there to get some normalcy in, in their lives. So, you know, there, there are literally, you know, at least two dozen, at least two dozen individuals um, here in Yapa who really are in some years. I mean, Sarah Adler, um, you know, she, she worked from home, came to work on, on occasion, but, you know, she was there every, every day supporting what we were doing. And it was hard because, again, we had to pivot. We had to do things that we weren't really sure about, we didn't understand. 
going to do a lot more research to make sure that, that we were being correct in our statements. Um, you know, but it was, it was, it was difficult. Then, you know, our, our, I think that you know in, in yourself that there were so many people um, out there in, in our community, whether it was there, Tom Belico, um, you know, those, those individuals who helped start the Independent Restaurant Coalition. Um, uh, we, we can't say enough about Jose Andreas, who's done some terrific, I mean, pre-COVID, you know, has been hard at work. Um, with a with a with an international committee trying to feed people, and certainly during COVID, doing the same thing. Um, you know, there there have been you know countless people um, who have committed themselves um, through some financial support. You know, for our restaurant relief fund, which have you know had significant impact on hundreds of of, of our young um, our, our our young staff who were out of work. So um, many many more than I could actually name, but I'm um, sure. Thankful and grateful and blessed to have been part of my life. Awesome. So as uh, we saw you on your Instagram posting all your cooking at home, um, when you consider how many different techniques there are in cooking from braising to grilling to modern day sous vide, what is your favorite cooking method and why? Um, well, you know, I like, I, I have to say, during the warmer months, it's putting something on the grill outside, and 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 why? Because I have to clean up the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, you can throw vegetables on there. You can you can throw turkey <laughs> on there. You make a salad. You open a bottle of wine and have a piece of baguette, and you're done, right? Yeah. Just yeah. yeah. Off the next day. So, and you know, you sit on the back porch. That really, you know, for me, you know, that's that's such a. a, a um, a moment where it's reassuring, right? I, I feel like I felt throughout my, 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 you know, throughout my life at those moments when you've been around a grill, whether it was with your family, with friends as you grew up, and then of course, you know, as an adult. So I think that would probably be my, my most favorite during the, the, the warmer months when you go outside. Um, during the winter months, it has to, you know, it has to be braising. Um, you know, it's just the, um, the transformation of food um, while, while braising something for long, slow periods of time. Um, uh, it just, the aromas that you get from it, it's just, it's so satisfying. Um, and, and it really kind of touches me, you know, deep inside in an emotional way. Um, you know, making a beef bourguignon or, or cocoa van or, uh, or, you know, e, 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 any, anything that has a transformation quality to it um, is something that's my favorite. And then, and then lastly, I mean, roasted chicken, I don't think this is something that surprises anybody. I mean, <laughs> it's probably my favorite, um, my favorite meal of all time. I just love, again, you know, the transformation of that chicken. And, and, and we all know how difficult it is to get a perfect roasted chicken. But, you know, in, 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 by, in, in, in saying that, you also have this sense of tolerance, you know, because it is a roasted chicken. So you, you don't mind something be maybe being a touch overcooked in the breast or uh, or things like that, because you you still have this great affection for what it is and the memories that you had around roasted chicken. I could not agree more <laughs> with grilling in the summer, braising in the winter. <laughs> yeah, kind of like seasonal. That's like, yeah, I think that that's great. Yeah. And it's like you were saying. I mean, the, the feeling of the either you're braising or something, or you're outside enjoying the sun uh, with a glass of wine or something like that. It has to be. It is. It's just great and something that sometimes is just simple but it's great and you don't have to uh wash the, the dishes uh, later yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, like my go-to go dish is, is 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 you know a sauteed piece of salmon and then you know and then spinach i think i did that on my instagram it's just the thing i love about it it's just so easy it's nutritious and you only have to clean one piece of cookware yeah, it feels kind of yeah. it, it feels kind of light too. But I I've really enjoyed watching uh, those those uh, episodes. I mean, you did the roasted chicken on the on Instagram too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I watched that one too. Um, so, chef, uh, you, uh, we were talking a little bit at the beginning about the pandemic and the entire uh, situation, the climate in the world, uh, the protests, the wildfire in California. What would you say to those young chef that they're feeling? lost or confused in their journey uh, that probably that they have no idea where to go what to do all of those that they lost their job or they got furloughed but they want to get back into the kitchen because probably like you said i mean you can go outside and and you can grill something or you can go inside and embrace something but 
some of those young chef and young culinarians, they don't have that option. So what, what should they do in this, in this situation? Yeah, you know, again, you know, we're really in uncharted territory. Um, we've never experienced anything like this before. I know that's going to, that is going to result in such, such a dramatic change. Um, you know, there's, you know, depending on who you listen to, we could be losing anywhere from 25 to 80% of all of our restaurants um, in, in our country. Uh, that's, that's devastating. When you think about any other profession losing anywhere from 25 to 80% of, of their, of their, yeah, it's crazy. it would be, it would be devastating. Um, so we're faced with, with challenges, I think, that other professions aren't really faced with. And our staff is faced with the same thing. And, and I really, really worry about the young ones. It's funny, I had a, a conversation about this several months ago with Gavin. And I was telling him, I said, you know, I, I, this is really difficult times. I said, but, you know, <laughs> I'm, in my, I'm, I'm, I'm in my autumn of my career. You know, you're like in the summer of your career. Um, you know, I've done things in my career that I never thought I'd ever accomplish. Um, you know, I could probably quit tomorrow and feel, and feel, you know, really comfortable of the things that I've accomplished and the things that I've done. Uh, but for someone like, like you, you know, or you, Richard, or any of the younger chefs that are out there today, you know, they have to restart their careers. They have to restart their restaurants. And, and what does that mean? That's going to mean as much effort, as much dedication, as much commitment when that restart begins as they had when they started their business or when they started cooking, when they started school. I mean, all these different, these moments in your life, these, 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 these bedrock moments in your life where you had to really commit yourself. Well, you know, we, a, lot of, a lot of young chefs were, were, were on their way. You know, they had jobs. They were progressing. They were, they, they were being recognized. They were learning new skills. Uh, they were progressing with their careers. Um, all that got put on hold. What restaurants are going to come back? And what are those restaurants going to look like when they come back is the big question as well. Right. Um, but the only thing I can say, you know, that, that, that I've always said about my career um, is you just can't give up. You have to be persistent. You have to persevere. You have to be patient as well. You can't expect something to happen overnight. You have to be there continually being, being, being patient and, and persevering. So when that moment arrives, you can embrace it and, 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 again, and, and again restart that career that's so important to you. Um, you know, restaurants have been around for 400 years or so. Um, we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, our profession – I've seen a lot of changes and, and, a, and, a, and a lot of turmoil, a lot of disasters, a lot of crisis. When you think about France or Europe in World War II, what yeah. happened to their restaurants? Um, you think about the, the Spanish flu, you know, in, in, in the early 1900s, what happened to restaurants after that? Um, so we, we, restaurants have always come back because they represent a place in our hearts um, that we, we go to celebrate. Um, we go to nurture ourselves. It, it doesn't have anything to do with with politics, it has nothing to do with gender, it has nothing to do with race, it has nothing to do with anything except the place where you can go and, 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 and be restored. And, and that's what, what restaurants are really about. And, and, and I want to remind people of that. It's a place that is neutral. It's a place for you to come. It's a place where we want to embrace you when you walk in. Um, and we want to make you happy. We want you to leave with a smile on your face. Um, and, and that's what restaurants are always have always been about. So will we survive? Of course we're going to survive. Um, will it be difficult um, you know, for, the, for, for the foreseeable future? Certainly it will be. But I really think, I really think once we get a handle on this, whenever that is, whether that's through some, some form of therapeutics, you know, we think, about, we think about HIV. It's been around I think, for 30 years. Yeah. Uh, we, we still don't have a vaccine for it, but we have wonderful therapeutics for it that, that allow people to live uh, you know, a, a, a normal, a semi, well, a, a, as normal life as they can. Um, whether we have really great therapeutics for this virus or whether we get a vaccine for it, something will happen, right? Our, our scientists um, around the world who have come together, and it's extraordinary to see that, um, we'll figure this out, um, and, and, and we will overcome it. We, we will overcome it um, as, as a community globally, uh, and, and then we'll have time for celebrating. And that's going to be exciting again. It'll be an exciting time for us. Um, and, and restaurants will be at the core of that celebration, the core of that nurturing, the core, the core of that rebuilding. And so let's just uh, let's be patient and, and persevere. And that uh, what you just said, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of uh, great uh, words that you just used. Uh, I think that one of the most important ones is going to be about commitment for everyone because 
I, I, I'm starting to feel, uh, I was talking with a couple of chefs that they're from here, from Miami, they have the restaurant and they don't have people because people don't want to go back to work. And that's one of the things that you just said about commitment, that you have to be committed to, to go, to, to go and pursue your, your dream and, and go back to where, where you were happy. And I think that that's, uh, that's great. And, and it's about inspiration and, and all of those different inspiration, motivation, commitment, and, and all of those that you, you, you just mentioned. Um, I think that it's going to be all about that. And like you said, we're going to go through. It's going to be difficult. Yes, it's going to be difficult. And, and that brings me to my next question that is going to be where or who do you look to uh, for inspiration? Which one is your source of motivation and inspiration? Yeah, it's you know it's it's interesting because I, I the word inspiration is, is a bit um, I, I think I, I think I define it a little bit differently. Um, inspiration for me, you know, happens very rarely in our lives, uh, and it's something that it may not have to do with what you're what you do. Um, and I think awareness is so important for us to to be able to to realize that moment of inspiration and then embrace it and interpret it in a way that's very meaningful for us. I think what we talk about when we talk about inspiration, we really talk about who influence us, right? Who are the influencers? So, you know, I pick up a cookbook when I was a young kid. I used to think I would be inspired by, by, the, by, by, by the book, right? Whether it was Paul Bocuse or Alan Chappelle. But actually, it wasn't necessarily inspiration as much as they were influencing me. Um, and that's an important, that's an important um, um, uh, thing to realize, at least from my point of view. Um, so, so those who I think are the, the biggest influencers in our, in our, in our lives today are, are those that show that true commitment to what they're doing, the dedication, uh, that, 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 that desire to survive um, and, 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 and move through this. So they're everywhere. They're not just, they're not just in our, our profession. They are everywhere around our communities. Um, and, and, and the important thing to remember, when I say community, I'm talking about globally. Um, the, the important thing for us to remember is that we're all going to make mistakes. You know, this is, this is a moment that is, um, is, is, is unparalleled for us in, in any kind of experience. So we don't know what we're doing. Uh, and we have to realize that mistakes are going to be made by, by everybody. Uh, and we have to, we have to have the, the ability to understand the empathy to allow those to happen. Um, and, 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 and the grateful and, and, and actually the appreciation for the opportunity to, to modify our behavior and change. And, and, that's, and that's a really important thing to do because we all have to be able to change. Um, and we all have to look deep inside ourselves and realize where we want to be, what we want to go, and, and, and be able to, 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 to commit to that, uh, to dedicate our lives to this moment in time where we're learning more about ourselves learning more about our profession, learning more about our country, learning more about the world. Uh, it's interesting, you know, when this first happened and everybody stopped. Um, and, and there were several articles over, over several weeks span on how happier our, our world was because the pollution had stopped. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Remember those? You yeah, it's all, true. All yeah. those videos with the animals walking through the, the town. <laughs> the city. Yeah. You know, it was, like, it was like this moment of freedom for just for the world, this moment of breath, this, right. this you know, and it was like, wow, that's interesting. You know, what, what, what have we done to, you know, to our world and, and how, and how it's, and how, and how it's now given us this, this glimpse of what maybe we could be doing for the future. But I think, I think inspiration and influence are, are, are two very important words. Uh, and I think inspiration is something that we have to be aware of what's going on around us. So, so when we truly are inspired, we can grab it and hold it and, and, and really interpret it. And then, and then be influenced, uh, and be influenced in positive ways from wherever you can find that influence. And again, it could be, it, you know, could be, it could be anywhere that's around us. We're influenced by so many different things. Um, but, but, but I encourage you to, to, to look to those who, who, who we believe in um, and be influenced by them. What would you say, Chef, to like a young culinarian who might aspire to, to follow in, in your footsteps? I mean, you, you went to the French Laundry years ago and you kind of had a vision, but you, know, you probably couldn't have seen in your mind's eye like what that would actually manifest into. But, you know, you knew you wanted, you wanted, to, you had a, you wanted to make your mark. You wanted to do something really special. I mean, in, in, a, in today's uh, era of just so, all this uh, kind of volatility, 
um, like, what would you say to a chef that's maybe trying to determine, like, can, you know, can I find my voice? Can I make my mark? Like, what, what would you say to somebody that might want to follow in footsteps? Good question. And there's certainly many answers. To that. I, think, I think that number one is, is accept criticism. You know, we are so afraid uh, to, to be criticized. And I think, you know, when, 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 when there's productive criticism, when there's criticism that's, that, is, that is focused on, on your ability to improve, uh, that's really important. So we all have to, to say, okay, criticism is a really good thing when it's delivered in an appropriate way because we can really learn from that. Um, and then accept your failures, right? Criticism and failures. These are, these are two, two things that we don't like to think about. Nobody wants to be really criticized and nobody wants to fail. But we learn so much from that. We, we, should, we should be holding our arms open for, for criticism, you know, again, you know, in, in the right way, delivered by the right person for the purpose of teaching, um, for the purpose of mentoring. And, and, you know, as chefs, I mean, we are extremely critical and, 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 and we're constantly giving feedback to our team, whether it's in the kitchen or the dining room, constantly every night, you know, so, you know, the idea, the idea of, of, of not being critical um, doesn't, doesn't, we, we don't understand that. But we have to make sure that we have tempered our criticism so that the person who's receiving it understands what you're saying and learns from it. And, and that's important, that delivery of criticism. But do we need to be critical? We always need to be critical of everything that we do individually and those around us and realize that. And then, and then the failures that, are, that, we, that, we, that we have, um, uh, the failures that we um, find ourselves um, in, we have to be able to embrace those as a learning moment. And I failed at two restaurants before I got to the French Laundry. Um, I was mortified. I was embarrassed. I was devastated. I, you know, I, um, I was in debt. <laughs> I mean, everything. Um, but, you know, it didn't stop me. I learned from it. Um, and eventually, you know, th those, failures learned to, uh, those failures led to the French Laundry um, and, and, and the success of that. Have I made failures since that? Yes, you know, because because they continue down that path. You continue to 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 explore. You continue to 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 be motivated. You continue to um, uh, to embrace new opportunities. And 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 some of them, you know, you fail at. And so, even though you've been successful in one way, it doesn't mean that you're that you're not going to fail in another. Um, but it, but embrace those failures um, because you'll learn so much from. Yeah, it seems like that's what really makes the difference. I mean, if you keep going and you don't let those failures kind of discourage you, uh, and and I think you know taking uh, criticism and and feedback. I mean, as I I look back uh, over my career, even going through Boku's door, as much as that feedback stings uh, to hear, it's a lot of times in your career you point to that as being some of the times the most tremendous growth. Um, and so yeah, it's it's what yeah, you a lot do of with feedback it. from me. I, I know you do. I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh my God. Yeah, 2012, 2013. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you want to talk about being intimidated? Uh, you know, going into a tasting and having you and Grant and Danielle and Gabriel and oh my God, it was like, uh -huh. all right, this is this is going to be a long critique. <laughs> but also, I mean, you know, think about think about the confidence and courage you needed to have to do that. I mean, that in and of itself, you know, is, is, is a great accomplishment. Just to have the confidence to go out and do it, you know, and the courage to, to face that kind of situation. Those are things, again, that are really important. Those words, confidence and courage, are really important for us. Yeah. So you have just been so successful as a chef throughout your career. If you could go back and redo it all and be anything in the world, what would you be? Um. A shortstop. A shortstop. Wow. <laughs> I used to say for the Yankees, but maybe for the Giants now. Um, you know, if, 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 if you had your dream come true, you know, I think for me, uh, growing up, I played baseball. And I oh, really wow. loved, I loved baseball. Um, but I also knew that I wasn't, wasn't good enough to really take it anywhere beyond Little League, really. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, I found, I found my, my place inside of the kitchen, you know, and I'm, I'm thankful that my mother – who ran restaurants, you know, um, uh, encouraged me to go in the kitchen. Um, and, you know, washing dishes is where I learned uh, six disciplines in my, in my life that have, that have been so important for me. Um, but, you know, I've always looked at, at, at a restaurant as, as a professional um, sports franchise, right? I mean, they're in a kitchen, you have, 
10, 12, whatever you have in your kitchen, three or four individuals, all doing, all having different skills, different disciplines, doing different jobs, supporting, you know, the team uh, and the team, the, the, the F team is to give the guests, you know, a great experience. And so it is a, it is a sports franchise and I've always looked at it that way and, and always trying to find, you know, those franchise players that allow, you know, as we grow older, we can't physically do the work. I mean, being in a kitchen, you know, or even in a dining room requires a, 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 a lot of stamina. Um, uh, it's a lot of work. And at some point in your life, you know, you're going to wear out. And, you know, if you haven't planned for that, as a, as a sports franchise has to replace Derek Jeter at shortstop, then they're not going to continue having the franchise that they want to have. So, you know, that idea of a sports franchise for me has always been a, a, a part of our uh, of our ethos, and uh, it's been it's 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 it's, it's done me very well because it's allowed me um, to continue to grow in, in my place, and and doesn't mean that I don't want to be back on the line cooking in the same way that Derek Jeter I'm sure wants to be back playing shortstop for the Yankees. He just can't do it anymore because there's somebody younger who can do it better. And when you realize that and you lose your ego, it, it allows you to to really to embrace and champion those who are coming up generationally and i think that's the wonderful thing again uh, about our profession especially in this time you know when i grew up in a profession that was a little more tightly knit and the chef was always he was always the chef and there was never any credit given to anybody else um and today you know it's in one generation that changed dramatically it changed dramatically so we're championing all those around us and the work they do and not just in the kitchen but in the dining room as well and so i think it's important uh, that we look at this in, in that way. And once you found your spot in the kitchen, once you found that this was your path, over the years, what have you found to be your favorite American regional cuisine? We know you love roast chicken, but as far as American regional cuisine, what would you say is your absolute favorite? It's a really good question, and, and I have to I boil it down to two. Um, it's either Southwest cuisine, you know, um, or... Uh, just real good southern cooking, right? I mean, I was in Greenwood, Mississippi once uh, visiting Fred Carl, who was the founder of Viking, and he had a, uh, a cooking school there based on southern uh, southern cuisine. And, um, there were there were five women who were, were teaching in that school, and I, I got there, and they laid out a, a, a banquet for me of some of the most incredible food that I've ever tasted. I mean, just beautifully prepared um, um, southern cuisine, whether it was grits, fried green tomatoes, we had something called comeback sauce because it was so good. You kept coming back from war. Oh, I like yeah. that. <laughs> you know, I mean, and the way that, and just the way they made it, and the love that they had for it. You know, this this expression of emotion um, in food, um, and you know, was was really paramount. And, and I love that. I love that idea of being emotionally connected to to, to what you're doing, and, and then giving that to somebody. And, and that was really a special moment for me in, in, in my experience in Southern cooking. I would definitely have to agree that there is just so much love put into Southern cuisine. And I definitely learned that after moving to Atlanta. Atlanta, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah and it's, I mean, that was probably the biggest compliment was to somebody yeah. say, wow, those, these are the best grits I've ever had. Yeah. There's a lot of love put in the food down here. <laughs> There's a very famous, was it a tea house down there? Um, the, the, the back after World War II, women who uh, started restaurants, they weren't called restaurants. I think they were called, um, I think they were called. Is it Annie, Annie Mac or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. And then people line up, you know, it opens at 11 o'clock in the morning. People line up around the block just to get in the, the door and it, you have to go. I mean, yeah, like tomato pie, I think is, oh, a, yeah. It's just, yeah. You, and you've, it's got, you, you don't get a menu, you have the menu, but you, you write out a piece, a slip of paper, slip of paper, what you want, you check, check the box of what you want. I mean, just walking around the restaurant is a, is, is a study of, of Southern history. Yeah. Very special place. Well, Chef, we're getting uh, pretty close here uh, to the to the end of the conversation. We could obviously talk with you all day, but I've got a couple more um, questions uh, we wanted to ask you, and I really have enjoyed all of the uh, all of your your answers and a lot of really just very very thoughtful. And I feel like a lot of people are gonna uh, walk away feeling kind of motivated and really kind of just having some direction as this year has been um, so so crazy for so many people. I feel like there was something here for everybody. 
Um, but one, one thing, you know, in your book, um, I remember reading through the French Laundry Cookbook, and there was always the importance of various aspects um, in the kitchen, like different techniques and, and fundamentals. Um, obviously, starting the uh, Mentor Foundation and, and how mentorship and, uh, um, you know, teaching and education, that stuff, I mean, I, I know what I know today because of the people around me. I mean, I, I've put a lot of effort in, but really the people around me, my mentors, the people that came before me, uh, they're really what kind of sh has shaped like who I am today. But if you could maybe just comment on, you know, the importance of, you know, the people that, that kind of came before us, you know, sure. uh, in, in, as far as our, our craft. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, we all feel, I think you and I feel the same way about this. And, and, it, and it really saddens me today that, you know, our part of our profession, which is, which is the, 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 uh, the culinary media, right. Um, doesn't, doesn't realize the uh, impact that um, those who came before have had on the younger generations. I mean, we all stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, and it seems in our in our society today, we've all we've, we've often forgot that that is the case. And it's always been really important to me because we don't learn unless we have somebody to teach, and those who are teaching us are the previous generations. And it's not just the previous generation, but the generations and. You know, it, it became apparent to me at, at a very young age in my profession, and um, uh, my mentor, Roland Hennen, uh, gave me a, a cookbook called uh, My Gastronomy uh, by Ferdinand Point. And um, I read that book. It's not necessarily a recipe book, although it has some recipes, and it's more of a story book. Um, but that book influenced, influenced my career um, to the core um, because it was about, about a chef who had given so many other chefs this opportunity to 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 excel and to go out and, and open their own restaurants or to go back to their family restaurants and make them even better, you know I think of Paul Bocuse who was at who was at Ferdinand Point at uh, at La Pyramide. Uh, I think about Ellen Chappelle, the Trois Gros. I mean there were so many of that of that band of Bocuse that we all know about um, who had trained uh, through that period of time um, and who had made their mark and who really influenced us. Um, Paul Bocuse was 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 an extraordinary chef. You know, he he was the first chef that went outside of the kitchen and made us aware that there was somebody in the kitchen of of notoriety uh, of, with such extraordinary skills and vision um, that we needed to recognize him as the chef and uh, and and Paul Bocuse and then all those all those that were around him at the time were, were so inspirational. There was one one other book that I I have to really talk about because. You know, my generation in America was so influenced by that, and that was The Great Chefs of France. And again, it wasn't necessarily a cookbook. Um, it was more of a storybook about some of the greatest chefs in, in France. Again, you know, Chappelle, Obis, Outhier, all these wonderful chefs uh, of that generation who taught us not just uh, to be cooks, but, but that it was a lifestyle, um, that there was an opportunity here to be part of a community uh, of chefs of restaurant tours that was not just in France but around the world, um, and how they influenced not just not just the people within their sphere of influence, but everybody uh, and, and food. And you know this began you know this began our our, our quest in America um, as young Americans to become chefs, uh, and their influence was profound uh, for us. And so. You know, going back generation after generation um, in in our profession, I've always felt I've always felt really comfortable in thinking that if there was a time machine, I could go back a hundred years and walk into a chef's kitchen and and be able to pick up you know kind of where I am today. You know, because we think about the techniques that we have, we think about the equipment that we use, um, and most of it has been around for generations. Uh, and 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 I, I really feel a connectivity because of what we do and how we do it and the basis of what we do. I mean, we still have a saute pan. We still have a fire, right? We still have, we still have oil. We still have a piece of fish. This, it, it's the same as it was 100 years ago. Um, and, 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 and that connectivity with all of those previous chefs, restaurateurs, you know, really kind of grounds me and gives me a basis for, for what I'm doing today. Um, so, yes, we stand on the shores of those who, who came before us. And our responsibility today is to make sure that those that come after us are better than us. I, I talk about three things um, when I talk about staffing. You talk about hiring somebody and how important it is to really take your time 
to make sure you're hiring the right person. And that person feels it's the right job for them, right? They're, they're, it goes a two-way street. So we had, that interview process has to be them interviewing us, you know, coming into our restaurants and seeing the environment, seeing what they expected, being able to say, yes, I can do that, and then analyzing them uh, to make sure that we feel that the same way. So hiring that person. And once you hire the person, you're 100% committed to them. It's not like you're 75% committed to them or 80% committed to them. You're 100% committed to that person, to his success and his training. And training goes on, as you know. It doesn't happen overnight. I mean, when I was young, when I was a young cook, I was hired because they needed somebody to fill a spot. I was trained for two weeks and then expected to do the job. I mean, that's the way it was. And if you didn't do the job, then you got your head chopped off. But that's, that's, <laughs> the, way, that's the way it was. And you persevered and you learned and, 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 and you were patient and you were able to do the job sooner or later. And, and hopefully the chef respected that and he kept you on. But today, training is much more different than it was then, right? And it takes... It, it, it goes on for, for not just two weeks. It goes on for months. I always say, you know, when we all learned how to swim, our mother put those floaties on our arms, right, so we wouldn't drown. And I'm sure she didn't say to you, if you don't learn how to swim in two weeks, I'm going to take the floaties off, and if you drown, <laughs> <laughs> right. No, she kept the floaties on for three months. But she didn't want you to drown, right, even though you knew how to swim. And so that's part of training. And then mentoring, as you mentioned, mentoring. And mentoring goes beyond just, you know, profession. Mentoring goes on, you know, goes to, to the core of the person, uh, helping them understand what, what their goals are, what they need to do, and how to do those things, both professionally and personally. They're part of a community, and they have to, they have to, they have to represent that community with, in a respectful way. And, you know, there's some younger chefs who, you know, who, who kind of go off, go off on, 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 on a tangent. It's not really respectful to, those, to his colleagues or her, her colleagues. Uh, and that's a problem for me. So we have to be respectful of this litany of, of great chefs, great restaurateurs that we represent today. And so if you mentor the person correctly, if you hire the person correctly, you train them correctly, you mentor them correctly, what happens? That person is better than you. Because if they're not better than you, you've done a shitty job. Yeah. So it's that, that's, that's kind of what we have to do. And I, I'm proud today that, I was talking to a guest last night, I'm so proud today that I can say that you know, today, David Breeden, who's our chef de goodie in the French Laundry, and Corey, uh, Corey Chow, our chef de goodie in the Se, they're better than me. And, and I say that with, with a, a huge sense of pride and no ego at all. They're better than me because we've given them everything that they need to be better than us. And so, awesome. and they'll do the same thing for the next generation because they see the example set today. Setting the right example is important. Well, Chef, I know we're coming up here on the, on the hour. Um, is there anything else that we haven't asked that you want to um, cover or any, anything else you want to mention? Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't think so. I think you've cut, we've covered a lot of things. I just want to talk about you know, not taking for granted you know, the, 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 the different periods in your career um, and to be able to recognize that everything that you're doing eventually will, 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 will benefit you. And so, you know, as a young kid, I was put in front of a dishwasher. And I, I kind of mentioned this a little earlier. And, and you know, I was, I was just filling time, really. Um, but I learned six disciplines standing in front of that dishwasher, right? I learned how important organization was. And, you know, if anybody here has washed dishes, you know that you set up a template for the, for the service staff to come in and put the, the dinner plate here, right? The, the salad bowl here, right? The, the bread plate here. The silverware goes like this. And, the, you know, all the glasses and the glass rack are set up specific glasses. So organization, you learn how to, how to be organized because you had to be, right? Um, you, you learned, you learned the, the, the moment of efficiency, right? You had to be efficient in how you, how you processed everything, how you racked the, the dishes so that you can get as many plates in that plate rack as possible or, or that you're, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you did your silverware and you put it in the, in, the, in the little silverware holder containers, that you put just enough in there, not too much, not too little so that they get washed, right? And then critical feedback, right? So organization efficiency, critical feedback. Because after after a minute and ten seconds, and that door opens to that dish machine, if that plate's still dirty, then then you didn't do the job you needed to do in the in the beginning of spraying it off or scraping it off or whatever. So that critical feedback was important. The idea of of rituals, right, became very important to me at that at a young age because I had to make sure that you know periodically, you know, I had to change the, the, the water in, in the dish machine. I had to empty the garbage. I had to sweep the floor. You know, all the different things that were done at a specific times throughout the day, you had to be to, 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 to be effective in that. So these rituals were, were important. The idea of repetition, 
right? I mean, you're doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, the same way that we as cooks do. You have to embrace that. You have to feel comfortable with that. Um, you know, because as cooks, we do the same thing over and over again. It's repeti repetition. Somebody comes to me and says, I want to do something different. You know, I will find a different job. I mean, this is, you're going to be cooking for the rest of your life. Nothing really changes. We can modify it better, but the skills, the skills are there. You're going to be chopping, you're going to be holding a knife, you're going to be cleaning a cutting board, all the things. Repetition was something that I was so comfortable with. And the last thing was teamwork. I mean, I was, I was the dishwasher, but everybody relied on me, right? The chef needed, needed the plates to plate the food. The, the bartender needed the glasses to make the drinks. The service staff needed the silverware. If I fell down on my job, then I affected the entire restaurant. So I understood I was an important part of the team. Those were the six disciplines I learned at 16 years of age, standing in front of a dishwasher at wow. my mother's restaurant. That, that really, that really um, helped me become who I am today. And I didn't realize that for a long time. So the point being is that, you know, what we do today um, is going to affect you tomorrow. And don't, don't give up on it. Um, um, be respectful of time. Be patient with the process. You'll get there. Well, Chef, um, just kind of, I, I'd say like in closing, just uh, one, one kind of comment I remember from a big uh, honor for me uh, was get, been going back to uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania one time, was being able to have the opportunity to uh, introduce you and to talk a little bit about you. And for me, being from southwestern Pennsylvania and going back to my old stomping ground uh, to be able to have the honor to be able to talk about you. And I, one of the things I point back to was I, I was – uh, in addressing everyone and letting them know that for me, one of the things that I remember most about you uh, in, in my time working with you was the, everybody thinks about like the recipes and you know, the dishes and all this stuff, but uh, you really like single handedly like made cutting tape in kitchens across America <laughs> mean something. And it really wasn't even just the, the act of doing that. It's really like what it represented. And it was just, like uh, exactitude and, and applying that to even just the little details and that you, you couldn't just take quality and just, it wasn't like a light switch where you just like, it didn't matter sometimes and sometimes it did. And, and, you know, I, I kind of remember that and I even, even here we are today in 2020 and I still kind of use those examples to uh, other young culinarians that kind of come into the kitchen uh, about what that means. So, you know, thank you for all those contributions and those little antidotes that uh, that we all. It really causes the pause and really think. And uh, you know, just want to want to thank you uh, for for giving us your time today. It's so valuable. We want to send you and your team our very best uh, uh, wishes that everybody gets through this uh, safe and healthy, uh, and that everyone's businesses uh, come back and recover. Uh, and, and thank you for everything you've done for the, the, the culinary community. And uh, we just, we really appreciate your, your time today. Well, thank you, everybody. That's a, it's thank been a pleasure. Much. It's, a, it's great to be, to see you, Richard. You know, I mean, we've spent a lot of time together and, and I have great admiration and respect for what you've done and what you've done for our country and representing us in, in Lyon. Um, you know, that's something that I, you know, I don't know if I, I would do, uh, but I really, really, <laughs> really appreciate that. Rachel, thank you for, for, for sharing your time with us and, and Christopher, very very good to see you again and, and appreciate Thank your contribution. You Thank you for it. Yeah. It's good. been an honor to be here. Well, stay safe, okay? And let's keep you too. Uh, keep persevering. We'll get through this. You too. Thanks so much, Chef. Thank Take you, care. Chef. Bye bye. Hey guys, thank you all for tuning in for another week of the Let's Dig In podcast. A big thank you to Chef Thomas Keller for taking time out of his busy schedule to be on the show. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And also thank you to all of our sponsors. Check out Vitamix website for their entire line of blenders uh, and appliances. Also check out Comey. Comey is a recipe and menu management software. That's what we use to manage all of our recipes uh, for everything that we do. And also Henkelman that you may know of from vacuum sealers for sous vide cooking. However, they have a brand new exciting initiative that they're getting ready to launch and that's vacuum sealing bags. But these bags are uh, three different types that are gonna be coming out 
And the first one is gonna be a bag and tray combo. And also the bags are recyclable. So that is a really important initiative for the future. We'll have more information about that in the future, but check it out, uh, check out their website. They've got a lot of other innovative equipment, but we're really excited about these bags that are getting ready to launch. Also check out the International Sous Vide Association. We become good friends with them over the last year, uh, was able to be able to participate in their virtual summit that they did this year. But if you're into sous vide cooking, these guys are the who's who. I mean, they're involved with all of the leaders in sous vide cooking, and it's a great organization. If you're really into learning about sous vide and cooking sous vide and you want to learn from the best, uh, check out their website. Uh, they are an outstanding organization. And also Verlasso Salmon. We use lots of different ingredients in our recipes and we really try to source out the very best. Uh, in South American Chilean salmon, uh, farm raised with Verlasso gives you incredible buttery texture and it's also sustainable, which is also important to us. So thanks to all of those sponsors for participating in the show and continuing to support us. And most of all, thank all of you for continuing to support what we do. Our tagline is food, inspiration, and adventure. And I hope that all of you get something out of everything that we share because we feed off of the guests and the energy just like you do. And it means a lot. If you could like and subscribe, we really appreciate it. So have a great holiday season and we'll see you next week on the Let's Dig In podcast.